conference, we also have uh, three, three speakers. And uh, we are going to listen to Pia van Gelder from University of New South Wales in Sydney. Next, Ashley Scarrett from University of Toronto. And uh, last not least, Megan Toy from York University. And let me say a few words about the first presenter, first speaker. Uh, Pia van Gelder is an artist, researcher, and PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales, Australia, working across platforms in transdisciplinary explorations of science, technology, art, and historical research, as well as curation and event-based art. Van Gelder's research investigates methods and philosophies of hacking, esoteric cultures and countercultures, electronic instruments design and media art history. With a working title, Microcurrents, Esoteric Electronic Instruments in the Arts, Van Gelder's PhD thesis examines a number of historical electronic instruments that were inspired by esoteric philosophy and experimental approaches to creative expressions and uh, healing arts. Van Gelder has exhibited and performed extensively in Australia and internationally, as well as lecturing at University of New South uh, Wales, Australia. This year, Van Gelder has been at Stanford University as a visiting student researcher and UCLA as a visiting graduate researcher. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I will just get right into this. So, uh, tonal therapy uh, records the experiments of young ultra-modernist composer Henry Cowell um, and physician and occult scientist Dr. William Dower and his wife Jane Dower at the Halcyon Sanatorium in 1921. A physician and theosophist with strong interests in occult medicine, Dr. Dower was a leader of the Temple of the People, which was a theosophical intentional community located in Halcyon in Southern California, where he opened the Halcyon Hotel and Sanatorium in 1904. Theosophy is a strand, for those who don't know, of esotericism, which was established in New York in 1875 and encouraged the comparative study of world religions, philosophy, the occult, occult sorry, and, ed, uh, and science. Theosophy uh, had prominent supporters from the scientific community like Thomas Edison, William Crookes and Oliver Lodge and had an important impact on many artists and musicians like Vasily Kandinsky and Alexander Scriabin whose field of colour music is where I would like to position this study. A total of 52 homes remain in the Halcyon community which were all occupied at one time by members of the Temple of the People. Some of these members uh, included the Varians, an Irish family who moved to Halcyon in 1914. John Varian, who worked in the sanatorium, was also an artist, inventor and poet. And he and his wife had three boys, Russell, Seagirt and Eric. The Varian house was also a meeting place for artists, writers, and it was here that the young composer Henry Cowell found a home. From an Irish background himself, at 13, Cowell had met Ver uh, Russell Varian and his father and was welcome in welcomed into the Varian family and also the wider Halcyon community. Musicologist Stephen Johnson writes that this contact reinforced uh, Cowell's Irishness and political idealism stimulated his interest in science, encouraged his unconventional treatment of musical instruments and provided an audience and a context for his early experiments in music. When Cowell eventually moved to New York, 
to pursue his career in music. He stayed in touch uh, with the Varians and also the Halcyon community who uh, welcomed him back to perform and teach. During the first decade of the century, the Halcyon Hotel and Sanatorium became a functioning place of respite, offering treatment for nervous disorders, drug addictions, tuberculosis and chronic illnesses, using a wide range of treatments on the cutting edge during the turn of the century, including a sol solarium with sun, air and water baths, colour therapies, chiropractic, and John Varian's osteopathic massage. In 1921, Dower travelled to San Francisco and attended a five-week course um, on a new approach to treatment and diagnosis by uh, the famous Dr. Albert Abrams. Abrams, a graduate of Heidelberg at age 19, was once a professor at the Cooper Medical College, now Stanford, and had also been the president of the State Medical Society of California. He now stepped, uh, he had, sorry, recently stepped down from this position to establish the American Electronic Research Association while his practices were becoming the subject of scrutiny within mainstream medicine. Many of his methods were based on the premise that uh, the body could be diagnosed and treated using electronic frequencies. For the purposes, though, of this short paper, I will concentrate on a system called Electronic Reactions of Abrams, uh, otherwise known as ERA, which Dower took back to Halcyon in late 1921. Abrams started with a study that proposed that different medical conditions could be diagnosed and listened to, uh, uh, by listening to, sorry, the sounds of a patient's abdomen while areas were percussed, which he called spondylotherapy. However, he found that these tests could only be performed when the patient was standing up facing westward in a dark room and depended on the, an attentive ear, among other things, which rendered, of course, the process to be quite lengthy and arduous for a sick patient. So Abrams developed an instrument called the dynamizer, which avoided these unnecessary pains and eventually replaced the need for the patient to come and visit him at all. This instrument was based on the principle that the vibratory state of a patient's body could be transferred into the body of a willing subject. Using cables and electrodes, Abrams connected patient to subject, rendering the subject as a kind of conduit while connected to the apparatus. Abrams then added a component with, uh, that would transfer these vibrations from the patient's blood sample acting like a recording of the vibratory state of a patient's body. This pl blood sample would then resonate these frequencies outside of the body, even into an envelope, um, and then onto the surface of the dynamizer. To make things even easier, Abrams found that his percussive examination technique could be replaced by passing a glass rod over the, uh, the subject's abdomen. The rod was found to resist or stick um, in areas that were correspondent, that had a correspondence with his uh, spondylotherapy uh, percussive studies. Once this technique was established, Abrams developed the oscilloclast. This time, instead of receiving frequencies from the body, the oscilloclast transmitted frequencies, both electronic and photonic. He proposed Caruso could, make, uh, could, could take a wine glass and determine its tone or vibratory rate by tapping it. Then, by singing that tone in the glass would shatter it. This is exactly what happens when you impose on disease its own vibratory rate by the oscilloclast. 
These electronic frequencies are so low in amplitude, they uh, were imperceptible, were determined by a kind of tuning process in the diagnosis, creating uh, something akin to a biofeedback loop. The conduit, uh, sorry, the condition was met with its own supposed vibratory rate through an electronic current directly applied to the body, which was intended to destroy the condition. You can see a diagnosis um, here. Um, if this applied frequency wasn't enough for co colored bulbs, uh, red, green, blue, and yellow, as well as a white light were installed on the acyloclast. Different colors were found to amplify specific diseased molecules in a blood sample. And these colors were also proposed to have curative effects on the uh, patient when, when viewing. To dower the, occult, uh, the occultist physician who had already been utilizing the radiant powers of the sun and color therapies, these techniques were not far-fetched. Um, but rather, they were in parallel with theosophical understandings of energy, the ether, and the subtle body. Between December 1921 and January 1922, Cowell visited the Varians at Halcyon and witnessed Dower's new electronic methods um, at the sanatorium. This instigated a series of experiments with Cowell and the Dowers, which investigated the therapeutic value of tone um, with the aid of Dr. Abrams' electrical devices which Cal reported in the Temple Artisan in May 1922 in an article called Tonal Therapy. Considering the elements already at play in the ERA system, the Dowers and Cowell hypothesized that there may also be a, uh, musical tones which could neutralize the di different conditions in the body. Given the fact that sound vibrations had the potential to penetrate the entire body, as opposed to light, uh, sound might prove to be more effective. So Cowell and the Dowers discovered that Abrams had already conducted some similar experiments without much success using a piano. Uh, Cowell proposed then that uh, they use a violin because its notes could be sustained for longer. Using blood samples from a patient with cancer provided by Abrams, notes were played on the violin while the instrument was placed on the same surface as the blood sample, rendering the dynamizer as a kind of bio cladney plate. As the violin played sustained notes up and down the scale, Dr. Dower examined his subject using the ERA rod they found that in areas where the rod and abdomen resisted, um, when particular notes were sounded, the resistance was found uh, to change. The notes E and B uh, appeared to eliminate the sticking present in the cancer uh, uh, subject, um, particularly when played in higher octaves. And this, Cal wrote, uh, could I quote, probably proved to be a curative effect, to have an, a curative effect. Cowell reasoned that the harmonic relationship between these two notes may provide a basis for a kind of tonal therapy musical rationale, explaining that E and B were a fifth apart, having a closed uh, vibration relation. Cal and Dower observed that other diseases were found to react to tones with the same relation, um, as can be seen in the chart here. Cal concluded that these experiments 
uh, with these experiments, a wonderful, I quote, a wonderful field for research is opened up for physicians, musicians and scientists. And it is to be hoped that energetic composers may find the idea of writing special music to be used in healing, in which the proper tones will predominate. Their findings were also shared with Abrams, who um, they reported was intending to develop an oscilloclast with a musical component. Although it is difficult to tell how much further the cowl dower tonal therapy approach was taken at the sanatorium, it would appear that their findings were influential. And as Dick Higgins comments, tonal therapy, and I quote, anticipate anticipated many notions which um, have become commonplace in musical therapy. Abram's oscilloclastophone, as you can see at the bottom of this page, was advertised in 1923, which amplified the electronic frequencies emitted by the oscilloclast um, into an earpiece, which was intended for both the, uh, the physician um, and uh, the subject. Um, or sorry, patient. Um, similarly, uh, this photograph pictured here displays Abrams examining a subject using an oscilloclast with a speaker attached, which is also dated in 1923. So it would appear that shortly after the Dower Cowell tonal therapy experiments, Abrams did in fact create his own colour music healing instrument. But in 1924, The Lancet published a report on Ab into Abrams' methods, one of a number of investigations to uh, discredit um, him uh, within the mainstream uh, medical community and were carried out over the last two years of his life. This did not stop Dower, however, who purchased a number of instruments uh, for the Halcyon Sanatorium, which further extended or expanded these techniques, including electronic colour therapy machines, in addition to magnet and Morse wave machines, continuing his practice into early the next decade. Although these approaches may not be may not have been accepted in mainstream medicine. They appear to be, an, um, be important for a different reason today. Converging multimedia with the healing arts, both the Dower Cowell apparatus and the Abrams ERA system with a oscilloclastophone presented unique speculations about the potential of media, particularly the connections between different manifestations of energetic frequencies and the body unlike colour music harmonies that were being explored elsewhere. These studies proposed harmonies that were based on the tactile interactions with the subject's abdomen and the possibilities of the body and its contents as a resonating medium. Here, media's material interventions was, intervention was explored down to the specific frequency with the intent of penetrating, resonating, and disturbing the diseased body at a molecular level. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. I'm sure you will have many questions later on. Uh, I'd like to ask the next speaker, Ashley Scarlett, University of Toronto. Uh, Ashley Scarlett is a doctoral candidate in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Her primary field of research lies at the intersection of art and technology with a particular focus on the theoretical dimensions of contemporary media art and creative practice. Ashley's dissertation on the matter of digital objects in contemporary media art explores contemporary new media artworks and making practices as a grounded means of engaging with the phenomenological parameters of digital objects and materials. Ashley has written and presented widely on her research in this field. A version of the paper she is presenting is, has been recently published in Digital Culture and Society. 
In addition to her doctoral work, Ashley is also a lecturer in OCAD University, where she teaches courses on the history of new media art and critical theory. Thank Your you. Turn. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, as the introduction suggested, uh, my current research seeks to theorize the material grounds of digital phenomena through largely aesthetic means. Um, so more specifically, I'm interested in how contemporary media artists are um, conceptualizing, aestheticizing, and grappling with digital materiality through their artworks and practices of making. Um, this project stems from a series of interviews that I conducted with 35 contemporary media artists. Um, these artists are artists that I guess we largely affiliate with Rhizome, uh, with XPO Gallery, with Sake and Transfer. Um, responding to prominent themes that emerged through a grounded discourse analysis of my interviews, I start off by arguing that digital materiality is an aesthetic phenomenon that exceeds the limits of both physical hardware and coded infrastructure. So just to be clear, that's a fairly traditional way in which digital materiality is approached within media studies. Um, so as a result of this, uh, my sense is that we need to engage in the development of new methods uh, or methodological approaches that will enable us to take better account of the uh, processuality and complex materiality that we're starting to witness uh, within digitally mediated environments. So that's effectively what my project tries to do. Um, I look at the interviews, I engage in analysis of them in conversation with a number of the artists' artworks in order to see what are the interpretive strategies that contemporary media artists are drawing upon in order to make sense of these emerging phenomena. Um, extrapolating from this analysis, I've then developed or picked up on four prominent interpretive strategies that come out of the interviews, namely uh, transduction, formalization, resolution, which is a topic that builds on some of Rosa Megman's recent work, and then catacresis. So today I'm going to pick up on the strain of catacrestic interpretation in order to start making sense of this idea of digital materiality. Um, I'm going to start off by giving a bit of an overview of some of the theoretical analyses of the contemporary media situation. Uh, I'll then position Johanna Drucker's Constitution of Aesthesis as a promising means of approaching this topic, a uh, fairly novel means of approaching this topic, and then I'll look more specifically um, at some of my findings. Uh, I'm going to have to speak very quickly, so ideally we can talk about this at a slower rate uh, after the presentation. Okay, so according to Boris Groys, let me just take the time here, great. Uh, media theory as a field of study is driven by an underlying anxiety and suspicion levied against the submedial undercurrents of mediation. Referring to the extra and contagious space that lies beneath media surfaces, the submedia lurks behind, it hides itself, and remains in the dark. Within our contemporary media context, the submedial accounts for the imperceptible space uh, between the physical and the virtual, where the digital is performed through programmatic and algorithmic means. From this perspective, it is framed as a unilateral placeholder lent to the materials of mediation that have proven too fast, too deep, or too complex to account for comprehensively. Current efforts to account for the submedial have been greatly complicated by the dissipating perceptibility of media devices and processes at large. As numerous, if not countless, scholars have detailed, media devices have thoroughly sunken into our environments and are acting at an affective and infrastructural level to articulate the very grounds of contemporary or for contemporary experience. No longer simply a matter of augmentative prosthesis, they have formed an informational ecology that is apprehending and shaping the world outside of the phenomenal field of human perception. Marking a strategic move towards greater immediacy, not only are media devices receding from view, but through their capacity to aggregate unprecedented amounts of information, they are also increasingly reacting preemptively, collapsing the time of mediation and further exacerbating its ontogenetic capacity. The perceptual disappearance of the medial identifies a shift away from the opacity of blackboxing towards a form of obfuscation through transparency. 
through processes of miniaturization and the forefronting of rhizomatic form and processual function, the whereabouts of mediation, let alone the submedial, is becoming increasingly difficult to discern. In this vein, while the proverbial black box promised a solid object of critique, readily identifiable and beckoning deconstruction, contemporary media devices are resulting in the erasure of reliable grounds for critique and political response. Accounts of digital materiality locate one area of scholarship attempting to expose and reaffirm the submedial terrain of 21st century media. In her treatise on speculative computing, Johanna Drucker argues that the specific, particular character of materiality always registers the circumstances of production, expression, and interpretation. Even within the fading temporal grounds of mediation, Luciana Parisi proposes matter as an archive of the future, a means of preserving a human capacity for prehension and preemption. As such, locating and exploring the material grounds of the digital, digital materials, may provide a means of uncovering, recovering, and maintaining a space for meaningful and significant engagement with contemporary media forms. To date, much of the existing scholarship to this end posits digital materiality as an irreconcilable, though sustained, duality. It generally accounts for either the physical infrastructure that undergirds digital systems or the semiotic expressions of digital code. While the literal and descriptive, oh, I, I should add an aside. This is what um, this slide is trying to document. Um, that duality that I've just outlined obviously misses accounts within uh, organizational studies and some of these uh, proto-archaeological and metaphorical efforts to, um, again, dig up the uh, historical materiality of media devices. Okay, where was I? Um, Okay, while the literal and descriptive analyses emerging from these camps of thought have filled critical conceptual gaps in a field plagued by a pervasive rhetoric of dematerialization, much of this work has been limited by its struggle to bridge traditional conceptualizations of materiality, as for example, stable and immediately perceptible, with the hidden processuality of the digital through exclusively technical means. In a world that is increasingly being articulated by the microtemporal refresh of digital devices, a new understanding of materiality needs to be developed that can better account for the material dynamism of digital processes as they take place outside the field of direct human perception. According to Johanna Drucker, a promising point of departure might be sought through aesthetic engagement with the interpretive strategies that digital materiality cues. This is an approach that she refers to as aesthesis. For Drucker, materiality is always a matter of interpretation. Rather than composing or delimiting solid objects, it denotes a probabilistic field of events defined by constraints and affordances in dynamic tension. Within this formulation, materiality is that which instantiates an interactive space for meaning making and knowledge formation. The materiality of worldly affairs shapes um, the experience and coinciding interpretation of a field of events. Here's the important turn. Uh, in turn, these interpretations fold in on themselves to shape how materiality is conceptualized and attributed to the event as such. As material constraints and affordances shift through time and space and in response to a variety of forces and innovations, so too does meaning and knowledge change. In this vein, rather than asserting an absolute stable definition of materiality, it must be approached relative to contemporary formations. Um, if we do sort of a, a, a lit review of how it is that materiality has been framed, particularly within the context of philosophy since the time of Aristotle, we discover that this solid, stable concept uh, in fact has been framed and reframed numerous times, right? So this, this conversation about taking chalk of materiality in relation to contemporary formations uh, it is a really important gesture when we're talking about digital materiality because it suggests that we can't simply rely upon these dated conceptions of materiality. We need to think about how new formations are affecting our perception of it. Okay. Um, According to Drucker, um, accordingly, Drucker has argued that digital materiality is intended to account for the simultaneity and situated experience of hardware, uh, code, and its specific materiality, modes of production that are integral to digital media, models and modeling processes, and the specific ideology of virtual artifacts. 
um, purely technological, code-based, or metaphorical approaches will fail to provide a comprehensive account of the complex simultaneity of these situated factors. In response to this perceived shortcoming, Drucker advances asthesis as a promising method for exploring materiality. Asthesis as method departs from an underlying uh, presumption that materiality is inherently aesthetic. It is the aesthetic capacity of matter rather than its presumed physicality that enables its experience and interpretation by attentive actors. This is a subtle but important difference. Uh, similarly, it is the aesthetic capacity of matter that bridges the physical with the ideal to shape the event of meaning making and knowledge formation. By exploring the aesthetic particulars of creative practices and work, we can start to bridge the different but coinciding components of digital materiality. Achieving this necessarily requires an approach that is active on numerous fronts simultaneously, working as or in conversation with practitioners to map out the technical grounds of their work, their creative practice, methods of production, conceptual impetus, and aesthetic output. Engaging reflexively with this collection of materials, aesthesis requires the researcher, in this case me, uh, to dwell reflexively within complex interpretations of materiality, while advancing speculative knowledge that remains fundamentally abductive, partial, heteroglossic, and probabilistic. Um, I'm going to jump over this just to quickly say uh, one of the things that I think many of us who study the history of media art are aware of is that since the 50s uh, there are many examples within the history of media art of artists reflexively engaging in the material parameters of their um, creative tools, of their works, of their methods of production, and their modes of dissemination. So looking to the history of media art, looking to um, the work that media artists are doing is in fact not, not that big a leap. In fact, a lot of the contemporary discussion around post-internet art or the new aesthetic actually locates shifting modes and experiences of materiality as being one of the central driving factors of this um, conceived shift in practice. So, um, in an effort to overcome perceived shortcomings in emerging scholarship on digital materiality, apply Drucker's thesis informed method and respond to materialist trends in contemporary media art practice, um, I conducted semi-structured interviews with 35 digital media artists. Um, how am I doing for time? Do you know? Five minutes? Amazing. Okay. Um, great. So, I conducted these interviews over the span of two years, 2013 to 2014. In fact, at the last Media Art Histories conference, I was just starting to approach participants. Um, and I conducted them to discern how digital materiality factored into their work and creative practice. Rather than delving explicitly into the intended meaning behind their works, the interviews focused on practices of making and overarching themes at play within individual artists' careers. All of the interviews included questions regarding creative process, software and tool use, art materials, shifting methods of digital and physical production, perceptions of the digital, and current topics in media theory. In instances where artists offered an account of their work or practice that coincided either explicitly or implicitly with tra traditional conceptualizations of materiality, the interview protocol would follow up with questions asking the artist to clarify, from their perspective, what it meant for something digital to exhibit materiality, what it was that enabled something or some practice to be deemed material. One of the central themes that emerged was artists' literal and metaphorical use of the senses as a means of accounting for and conceptualizing digital materiality. Given the aesthetic nature of the discussion and long history of philosophical accounts that connect matter with the senses, this theme was largely unsurprising. Um, I should add here that, in fact, it wasn't only unsurprising because of this history that I've just identified, um, but also for for example, uh, glitch artists, this idea of opening visual data um, within sonic environments and collapsing the senses through this 
you know, type of post-media creative process uh, is a very common practice. So extrapolating from the mode of data that they're using to the senses didn't really seem like a surprising or big leap. Um, that being said, one of the more curious developments was artists' repeated use of the senses synesthetically as a means of speculating about modes of digital materiality that were proving phenomenologically and conceptually evasive. So in this case, I'm talking about instances like in Lorna Mills's interview where in fact, um, in almost the same breath, she said, I have no interest in working with sound. Sound is not a component of my work. And yet then she described the material attributes of her work um, as a silent percussive instrument. And this happened repeatedly throughout the interviews when artists were kind of cornered and forced to make sense of the material components um, of their work. I have a few examples that I will cycle through right now. So, you know, on the one hand, it's interesting to identify this phenomenon, this pattern, um, but of course, those of us in the humanities uh, know from our critiques of big data that in fact, identifying patterns is not enough. So the question becomes, okay, well, what is going on here? What can we extrapolate from these interpretive strategies that might actually help us to make sense of digital materiality in its own terms? Um, so effectively what I end up arguing is that these are synesthetic gestures. Um, when we talk about synesthesia, we're talking about um, on the one hand, the sort of physiological phenomenon in which uh, one sense modality ends up exciting a different sense modality. Um, our most common encounter of this is actually through metaphor, right? So Vivian Sobchak writes about this quite extensively where she says, you know, we use this metaphorically all the time as a, poet a poetic augmentation, a way of, you know, shuffling language around to add meaning. Um, now, this being said, I think a more interesting strain of thought actually brings us into the work of Paul Ricoeur, who delineates two separate types of metaphor. There's one type of metaphor that's poetic augmentation. Okay, this is beautiful, uh, flowery, fancy language. But the secondary form of metaphor that he identifies is metaphors that we use in order to identify and fill a gap in language. Okay, and these are metaphors that if we turn to the work of people like Paul Deman, Judith Butler, um, uh, Derrida, right? These are catachrestic gestures. These are the limits of representation, the limits of language. And in fact, all three of these writers talk about how it is that materiality can only ever be defined through these catachrestic gestures. Um, so I have to wrap up. Unfortunately, I don't get to my uh, big minor conclusion. Um, but that being said, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for being so generous with the time. The third speaker is Megan Choi. Mm, Megan is a PhD candidate at Art History and Visual Culture at York University of Toronto, Ontario. Her research explores the intersection between communication disabilities and aesthetics, spectator spectatorships and affect, and phenomenology and cognitive science. She completed her MA in Art History at McGill University in 2013 and worked as an assistant curator at the Alternator Center for Contemporary Art in Kalovna. She is a recipient of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council Doctoral Fellowships and has been published in Drain Magazine and the Journal of Curatorial Studies. So this paper is a mix of things. It's mostly coming from my MA thesis and I'm developing it into my PhD project as I start it right now. Um, so I'll just, I'm just gonna go for it. Uh, this paper is about how aphasia has been taken up within contemporary multimedia installation art and the potential for ethical spectatorship that emerges through various aesthetic and exhibitionary strategies. Um, aphasia is a communication disability caused by stroke or brain damage, and it results in the loss of ability to use words. Um, an aphasic individual may be able to speak to some extent, but the ability to insert words into a meaningful, coherent sentence structure is often disrupted. 
So it's generally characterized by a loss of speech um, in stroke patients. Uh, it's rarely articulated as a disability and it's normatively construed as a communication disorder. And so in many ways, aphasia falls into what disability scholar uh, David McRuer would call an elusive CRIP subjectivity. He defines this as disabled subjectivities that are largely invisible to the public or go undocumented. Um, sorry. Uh, so just to expand on what CRIP means, uh, Robert McGruer coined the term as a way to discuss the overlap between queer theory and disability studies. While acknowledging the important work that has been done in terms of disability activism, such as fighting for disability rights, equal ac access, and public recognition, CRIP theory moves beyond an affirmation of a disabled subject position in order to open up what defines that position in the first place. So in many ways, CRIP theory queries the ways in which the very boundaries that define disability can be blurred, destabilized, and redefined. So beginning research on this topic, what struck me the most about aphasia was how it was largely an unknown disability, despite that it affects a large amount of people. Um, in her 2009 article, Public Knowledge About Aphasia, a comparative survey, or a survey with comparative data, Laura Flynn published the results of a telephone survey that was conducted in the UK. She notes that 13.6 of respondents had heard of the term and fewer than 6% had basic knowledge of the condition. Furthermore, she also found that, public, that the public had stronger knowledge of Parkinson's disease despite the fact that Parkinson's affects half the amount of people. So in many ways, aphasia is a disability that is not immediately recognized. And so a question emerged. How do visual art practices that are addressing aphasia allow it to be more widely recognized by providing a space for the, uh, the representation of aphasic subjectivity? But beyond this, I was curious how multimedia installations that activate spectatorship can also encourage the performance of a CRIP subjectivity on behalf of spectators. So put in a different way, I'm curious how certain aesthetic strategies can allow for a CRIP specta spectator to emerge where the boundaries between aphasic, non-aphasic, able, disabled, normative, and non-normative subjectivity can be blurred and redefined as an embodied form of communication emerges. So through uh, showing how the body can speak when language fails, the installations I address in this paper disclose meaning making as an embodied process that takes shape through intersubjective, gestural, and affective forms of communication. As I will argue, it is this intersubjective and affective element of speech and voice that often gets overlooked or omitted within the literature on aphasic speech therapy, and it is these elements that have the most potential how, to, how we understand disability and facilitate communication across the aphasic, non-aphasic, and abled, dis uh, disabled divide. So, the notion, I'm just going to turn to like one brief article on uh, aphasic speech therapy, just in terms of time, that's all I have. Um, so the notion of recognizing embodied communication as meaningful is somewhat recognized in the article Speaking for Another, the Management of Participant Frames in Aphasia. So here, Nina Sim simmons Mackey and Misty Schultz discuss how an aphasic patient and, co and, an aphasic patient and nurse co-construct meaning through their interaction. While they acknowledge the gestural and bodily aspects of Rob, who's the aphasic individual, um, their analysis still heavily relies on the cognitive ability of the nurse to guess and then reconstruct what the aphasic in individual was trying to say. So in the end, this still fails to consider how the bodies of each participant, that is the aphasic and the nurse, meaningfully communicate with one another. They state, Quote, Rob, the man with aphasia, effectively created meaning by using a layered combination of nonsense syllables, prosodic variations, three words, and gesture to elicit spoken guesses from speaking partners. In other words, his ability to, tr to transmit an idea depended not on his utterance alone, but on the co-participation of his speaking partners who guessed what he wanted to say. Well, we can see here an articulation of the role of the body within the communication process. Their conclusion still functions with what uh, disability studies would consider an ableist model of subjectivity. 
That is, it assumes that the medical expert, the nurse, has a superior, superior cognitive ability, which allows her to interpret the content of what was expressed by the implied inferior uh, aphasic. On top of this, it privileges, it privileges the cognitive ability of one rather than the bodily and cognitive ability of both, uh, both nurse and patient. So in that sense, it omits any consideration of the embodied and relational aspects of subjectivity and experience. Um, so in the installations I will be discussing, the opposite occurs. Aphasia is not just represented, but it is also active, effectively felt and engaged with. Through a very close reading of the work and the aesthetic forms that are used, I will argue that the installation of Image and Stidworthy in particular for, the, uh, for this paper structures an ethical space wherein spectators are tensely and ambiguously situated in between their own sense of self and the experience of an aphasic other. Engaged at the limit of self other, disabled and uh, abled, the perceived boundaries of subjectivity and normativity unravel as the co-constitutive dimensions of meaning making unfold in the embodied space that exists in between. So upon entering the Whisper Herd, which is the title of Imogen Stidworthy's work, um, it was exhibited at Matt's Gallery in London, UK in 2003. Uh, spectators are immediately confronted with a large circular screen that displays various hand gestures. Accompanying this screen is a speaker shaped like a satellite dish that plays the voice of a man. Proliferating throughout the space as a whole is the voice of a young boy. The gestures and voices present themselves to spectators like questions, providing them with a sense of something that is incomplete. So let's just start with the first voice that is dominantly heard through the satellite-shaped speaker. It's the voice of Tony O'Donnell, a middle-aged man who suffers from aphasia. Tony is responding to a text that Stidworthy had read to him, and what we hear is the way in which he attempts to make sense of and draw relations between the words within the text. He repeats over and over the words silence and listening, slowly articulating each letter of the word, each letter of the words. These words interpolate spectators into a receptive position where they don't need to act but are asked to attend. Um, as they are attending to the speech production process, the materiality of the aphasic voice becomes more and more apparent as the words fail to cohere into a linear sentence. So put another way, the conceptual content of the word, which is normatively perceived first, is diverted here in favor of the bodily uh, and gestural aspects of speech production. So with no context given and no clear structure in Tony's speech act, spectators are left to ponder over the sense of the words in a manner that is similar to, what, uh, to the way in which Tony would. Uh, for the aphasic, specifically in Tony's case who suffers from what's known as Wernicke's aphasia, the relation between signifier and signified, as well as the relationship between signs, is dismantled. So aphasia typically takes two forms, Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, and neurolinguists have localized language production in the Broca area and linguistic comprehension in the Wernicke area. So along with the speaker that exudes Tony's voice, there is a screen that displays Tony's gesture. The video shows how Tony's body moves and contorts when he's attempting to grasp the words and text. There is a tenseness and rigidness in his body movement that conveys his struggle to speak. As Tony's hands move both in tension and at times in tandem with his voice, spectators begin to witness the embodied process of linguistic expression unfold. That is, his gestures begin to speak and his physical movement appears to be filling in the gaps in his sentences. Um, as Tony attempts to say the word listening and silence, we can see how his hands are helping bring these words into existence. And so it seems that the gestures don't just add another layer of meaning to the already constituted thought, but they seem to actually speak, helping bring into existence what he is trying to say. In the Phenomenology of Perception, Merleau-Ponty lays out a theory of expression where language use is conceptualized as a way of taking up the, wor the world or a style of relating to the world, which is articulated concretely and effectively through the body. In his theory of expression, speech carries a primary sense that has an effective value 
and this can be seen in gestural signs in particular. Merleau-Ponty argues that speech and expression cannot be torn away from their concrete or material foundation because it is through grasping this effective layer that a style or manner of being in language is formed. Uh, so the video of Tony's gestures bring the body into the foreground of perception and render the habitual movement um, of the body during the speech act primary. Furthermore, the gesture does not signify a single word, but articulates an effective sense of the word that is constantly changing and transforming, thus rendering the meaning of it open. Merleau-Ponty states, quote, the gesture is in front of me like a question, and it indicates to me specific sen sensible points in the world and invites me to join it there, end quote. So this is precisely how I read Tony's gestures are functioning in The Whisper Heard. They are indicating a sense of the words, but the context and meaning of these words is left open for the spectator to complete. Um, the next aspect of the installation is divided from the first by a white hospital-like curtain. The choice to use curtains instead of building a wall to divide the space is important here because not only does this create a sense of unease by signifying um, the illness that's connected to a hospital space, but the curtains also allow the two, spa the, the two spaces to speak and flow into one another. So in the second space, we see Tony's face on a television screen in the middle of the room. Here we can see how his face and move, uh, mouth move during the speech act. His voice is not completely cut off from, his, um, from the, his face as each element feeds into one another through the loose division of the curtain. So when the spectator is in the second part of the installation, they can also hear the speaker from the room over, which plays his voice. So this creates a distance between the two signifiers, face and voice, which again breaks down the signification process and opens it up. So nothing is direct, uh, signified directly through the image of Tony, but rather uh, meaning takes shape between the two installation spaces through the spectator's divided engagement and attention to both. So as we attempt to piece these elements together, the spectator, like an aphasic, feels a sense of alienation from the meaning that is attempting to be conveyed. They are suspended within the process of meaning making, struggling to find its result in between two aesthetic experiences. So this tension between two aesthetic experiences can be said to stage what Rantier calls an aesthetic rupture. He says, quote, uh, aesthetic rupture for Rantier implies, quote, a move from one given world to another in which capacities and incapacities are differently defined, end quote. Um, so as spectators struggle to understand what is being said and begin to apprehend the words spoken through the effective capacities of their bodies, they begin to feel with Tony that is, they begin to experience through their own sense of embodiment the confusion and alienation that an aphasic feels when attempting to comprehend a text. So a crip spectatorship emerges through this aesthetic experience as the distinction between ability and visibility begins to get blurry. Um, so engaging with meaning-making process as it, is, as it unfolds between aesthetic forms and between self and other, Spectators are asked what it means to engage, relate, and feel with another when language fails. So to conclude, I just wanted to maybe touch on the ethical aspects um, and return to an early feminist article. So in the article, um, The Problem of Speaking for Others, feminist philosopher Linda Alcoff states that quote, we should, try, uh, we should strive to create, wherever possible, the conditions for dialogue and the practices of speaking with and to, rather than speaking for others. Um, so this, for me, prompts the following question. What does it mean to speak with someone who has lost his or her ability to speak? Um, as I have hoped to show, the aesthetic practice of an image instead worthy allows this type of communi communication to begin. It creates a dialogic space where speaking and expression unfold as embodied co and co-constituted through mutual interaction, affect, and gesture. Um, so in the end, it seems that the space of Im immersive multimedia art has the potential to disclose meaning making as an embodied dialogical process. It is a space wherein we can begin to speak with bodies that are, have, already, have always already spoke. Um, and speak with bodies that 
say more or say differently than they mean to say, as Judith Butler once put it. And that's it. Thank you very much. We are going to have the question and answer session now, so you are all invited to participate. So if anybody would like to make a comment or ask a question, please give me a sign. Uh, myself, I was very much uh, interested in the issue, uh, very much present in all three talks. Uh, about the relationship between art and, and science. Uh, I, I have participated in all conferences in this series, and I may say that uh, the interest in the uh, interactions between art and science is much deeply present on the side of art, artists and, and art researchers that on the side of, uh, of science that the view of these relationships are completely different from both sides. And uh, this is obvious that uh, art um, engaging in the process of dialogue with science has to reconstruct the aesthetical patterns, but sometimes we, we forget that uh, something similar should happen on the other side if science can seriously look at the artists uh, engaging in, in scientific practices. So uh, I'd like to ask a question, uh, you, Pia, because uh, you mentioned in the field of your interest uh, hacking. Uh, I'm curious if you think that uh, the use of esoteric approach to understand relationship between art and science is sort of hacking science with esoterics? Very provocative uh, <laughs> uh, idea. And I think uh, might be problematic or uh, might s sort of I, th I think if we understand hacking, um, I guess, um, in, a, in a way, uh, an act of uh, subverting or negating the boundaries of institutions and disciplines, then yes, I would say. But uh, I, I, I fear I might offend um, my case studies by saying uh, that they, they were, in fact, hacking. Um, but it, no, because if you think about, sorry, I'm just speaking out loud here. Um, if you think about the original sort of definitions around hacking, which is very much about a, a novice or a person without uh, traditional training uh, coming to, into a field um, and, 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 and using you know, creatively what, what, what uh, uh, they have available to them. Uh, then perhaps also, yes. Yes, yeah, so in different ways, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you know something about the uh, effectiveness of these practices? Um, okay, yeah, so, and, and, and also, uh, I, th I think as essentially it's still practi practiced today and, and in, 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 in some ways uh, Abrams and many different, uh, there are so many case studies of people uh, experimenting with the idea of electrotherapy. So electrotherapy is an established field inside now um, mainstream medicine, uh, particularly in pain relief, uh, in the areas of pain relief. So, um, so uh, but outside of pain treatment, um, it's probably been less uh, respected or taken on less by mainstream mm -hmm. medicine. Outside of mainstream medicine, it's yeah, still widely uh, practiced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for indicating me this, this example, also you, because I was very much involved in the research on um, uh, Diane Gromala, uh, immersive interactive installations, uh, treating the uh, constant pain. So 
I mean, the, the making this field of observation larger is very fascinating to me. I'd like to ask you uh, uh, another question, uh, uh, Ashley, because uh, when you referred to, to Drucker's uh, concept of interpretation as a background for the analysis of, of material objects in art, I had a feeling that you would like to to, to approach this issue without uh, getting into ontological perspectives. Uh, I had a feeling that you would like to stay in the framework of phenomenology and talk about materiality. Is it like this? Um, not entirely, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm very much like to, to listen to your right. answer. So I guess one of the things that I'm interested in is the um, is computation as metaphysics. So the ontogenetic capacity of computational systems or digital forms. Um, and you know one of the things that interests me, where I think this conversation about digital materiality, at least for me, is headed in how it is that we need to develop new concepts of materiality in order to take account of these fairly new um, experiences that we're having in relation to digital phenomena. So on the one hand, yes, I'm interested in the phenomenological, I'm interested in surface effects, um, but whereas we frequently treat surface effects as a matter of semantics or semiotics, I'm actually interested in looking at them from more of an ontological perspective um, within the realm of computation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why much of my work on digital materiality doesn't look at technical systems or code or whatever it might be. It, it really focuses on the digital phenomena that we are experiencing and encountering. Because I think for many of us, um, that's why we invest in the digital. That's why we invest in media and media studies. So. OK, thank you very much. Megan, uh, did you find more examples of similar approach as the one you examined in your yeah. talk? Yeah, there's, um, it's actually taken up a lot by women artists. So I'm trying right now, I've noticed Anne Hamilton did a piece in 91 that had um, an aphasic voice that played when spectators moved around the space. It played on the outside of the Dia Foundation. Um, and then, Jana Sturbeck also has a piece that includes aphasia, and um, Carrie Tribe, who's based out of LA, just did a big uh, immersive installation on aphasia as well. So I'm trying to think about it now, uh, moving forward, uh, in terms of like maybe a feminist politics of the voice um, as well, because it just seems to me that there's something about aphasia that uh, uh, women artists are kind of leeching onto. But We'll see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Any question, any comment? Yes? Uh, I have a question for Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, it's an old fashioned research question. Uh, how did you get your sample? How did you arrive at, the, I think you said 30 artists that you chose? 35, actually. 35? Just over, but yeah. Oh, I, I can use this. Um, okay. Well, I have a background in the social sciences, um, and one of sort of the fundamental methodological approach that I used was grounded theory. Um, so I started by doing a background literature review to see which artists in the field were explicitly contending with digital materiality through their work. Um, so I started with the artists um, Phil Thompson, and Jan Robert Lichte, um, and, and a few others. And then effectively after that, I engaged in snowball sampling methods. So. Yes, and others? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one, one question for, for Pia is, um, I would like to know, uh, Two things, uh, th actually it's two questions. One is, um, was your doctor aware that other people use non-tonal systems? 
and, and about the existence of overtones. So how these uh, tones, which come from post-Bach uh, yeah. uh, 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 tem temporary system, work on other people like Papua New Guinea or, mm -hmm. or Chinese? And the second question is that uh, what, what was his, his uh, relationship with, with, uh, with, uh, with futuristic e e e experiment of sound like Russolo's Intona Rumori or things like that? Uh, okay, first question for you is which doctor? <laughs> no, uh, I'll, I'll just concentrate on the case study that I'm, I'm trying to focus on, which is the Cowell Dower uh, case study. So Dower being the doctor, he was a, a physician. Um, was of course very uh, aware of uh, non-tonal, atonal, um, uh, due to the fact um, that he came from a theosophical uh, uh, education or, 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 or uh, community. Um, and uh, Cal also, um, in, in his biographies, uh, uh, his education uh, in mo like music from around the world uh, at, at an early age, very, very early age, is, is quite prominent. And his uh, work uh, p post and pre, he, the tonal therapy was actually the first single authored paper by Cowell. Um, and uh, he followed on uh, to write a number of books and pieces on harmonics. And he was very interested in the, uh, in the uh, sort of breaking down the boundaries, I guess, of, of traditional uh, Western notions of, of harmonics. So, uh, yes. Um, what was the second question? Sorry. Did he work on, uh, on people coming from other uh, musical systems? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Did, did it work? What did... The other therapy. Ah, oh, that's a really brilliant question. I am not... I... I'm not sure. I, I can't. I don't know if there were any subjects in the Halcyon community who, you know, participated in the study and da Dower's therapies that weren't from a Western background. I would have to do some further investigation on that. That's a very good question. Thank you. Oh. Okay, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think that might be a stretch for that period, specifically um, for uh, p perhaps Cal, but not Dower. Cal being, you know, the uh, ultra modernist composer, very recognized composer in, 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 in American music history. Um, but he I had yet to participate in European tours. Um, however, he was very in contact with the New York uh, contemporary uh, composition community. So, yeah, possibly, yeah. Yes, uh, one uh, contemporary Polish composer, uh, Rafał Zapała, uh, he makes the music uh, with the use of feedback. So the brain activity influenced the construction of the music. Yes. This is probably quite possible to, to revert this direction. So it becomes actually interactive. Mm -hmm. So not on the brain um, acts uh, in the st musical structure, but yes. on the other side as well. So, uh, more questions? <laughs> Cecile, she looks happy that there is no more questions. So yeah, I'd like to thank very much all the speakers. I'm, Thank you. I'm very...